Welcome back. Last time, we saw how images are represented on the NES. Most importantly, we saw that images only store references to colors. These colors rely on something called a palette. In this video, we'll learn more about how the palette works and how the NES is able to turn something that looks like this into something that looks like this. First, we'll describe the palette and then talk about how games can control it. A palette is a collection of colors. These colors fill one of four slots in the palette. When applied to a tile image, the palette turns a grayscale image into color. The NES has two different sets of palettes, one for the foreground and one for the background. Each of these sets holds four palettes, and each of these palettes has four, but really only three, usable colors. Here is one way to visualize this. The background art for an NES game typically uses a different set of colors than the characters and other things that move around. Characters often use higher contrast in order to stick out relative to the background. The design of the NES acknowledges this, which is why it supports two different sets of palettes. You may have noticed that the first color in each of the background palettes is the same, as is the first color for all the foreground palettes. This is not an accident. Color zero actually indicates unused or background, depending on how the image is being drawn. In addition to using different sets of colors, the NES actually has two different techniques for drawing, depending on whether it is drawing for the background or the foreground. We'll see more about the actual rendering of this in a future episode. In both the foreground and background, the value zero in the palette essentially means empty, or fallback to whatever is underneath. For something in the foreground, this will result in the background showing through. This is what enables characters that are not completely square. For the background, value zero of the palette actually specifies a default background. Some games use this to implement a sky color, for example. Each of the two drawing modes have some way of specifying which of the palettes within its appropriate set to be used. Now that we've talked about what the palette is, let's talk about how we can use it. So let's assume that the game is already set up to draw a tile and has somehow specified which palette number to use. How does the game get colors into the palette in the first place? The palette is actually a special region of memory managed by the PPU, or the graphics chip. The CPU is not directly connected to this palette memory, and so it needs to ask the PPU whenever it wishes to make changes to the palette. It does this using a technique called memory mapped IO, or MMIO. We actually saw a little bit of MMIO when we discussed cartridge mapping. In that case, the CPU is able to read from a cartridge ROM because the cartridge has mapped the ROM into memory. So memory addresses starting at a certain location actually get mapped to the ROM chip. Interaction with the palette is similar in that certain memory addresses signify communication with the PPU and thus the palette. In this case, however, rather than going directly to another storage chip, the PPU exposes MMIO addresses to act as sort of commands that control graphics in various ways. Nearly all interactions with peripherals on the NES are accomplished via MMIO. Let's take a look at how the PPU palette MMIO works specifically. The PPU provides a few MMIO addresses to interact with the palette. First, it is worth mentioning that the PPU has its own memory disconnected from the CPU, accessible directly only via the PPU. The PPU controls access to this memory, or VRAM, through the use of these MMIO addresses. In order to interact with the palette, there are two MMIO addresses we care about. First is hex 2006. This is sometimes called PPU address. This is write only. If the CPU attempts to write here, what this does is set the VRAM address to which the PPU will write. Since memory holds bytes, and an address is two bytes, the CPU needs to write here twice. The upper byte, or more significant byte, of the address is written first. We'll see an example in a bit. Next is hex 2007, or PPU data. Each byte written here will be copied to the current PPU address. This also increments the address. To better understand VRAM writes through these addresses, let's take a peek at a little bit of the VRAM memory map. Just as certain regions of CPU memory have specific purposes, the PPU assigns responsibility to certain ranges of VRAM. These first two ranges we saw a little bit of previously, and these are how the tile data we saw get mapped into video memory. Towards the end of this range, we have 32 bytes that correspond with palette memory. Each of these 32 bytes correspond with a different color in these 32 colors supported by the palettes. We have two groups for background and foreground. Each set has four palettes, and each palette has four colors. Two times four times four is 32, and one byte per color. There is a fair bit of interaction going on here, so it might be helpful to illustrate with an example. This little program will write hex 1c, which corresponds to kind of a dark cyan, into background palette 0, position 0. This will set the background color used when neither the background nor the foreground image cover a particular pixel on the screen. First, we need to set PPU address to hex 3f00. This is the first byte 
in the palette, which corresponds with the background palette zero, position zero that we want to write. Since the PPU sets the upper byte first, we need to first write hex 3f, then hex 00. This little program accomplishes that. First, we load the accumulator with 3f, then we store it into the PPU address, MMIO register, then we load 0 into the accumulator, and then we store the accumulator again into PPU address. After these four instructions, the PPU address is set to hex 3f00. Now that we have PPU address set up, we need to write to PPU data to actually set the value in that palette. We want to write 1c, so we load the accumulator with that value and store the accumulator this time into the PPU data register. And because PPU address was previously hex 3f00, this accomplishes writing 1c into the VRAM memory at position 3f00. After this store, PPU address is also incremented. This auto increment behavior makes it convenient for setting long spans of VRAM without needing to write PPU address between each value. But it also makes it possible to write only a single value, if that's what you want. And to show that this program actually works, here it is running in the online emulator that I'm working on. You can see that the background, even without drawing anything else on the screen, is set to this cyan color that we just set up. So at this point, you might be wondering how hex 1c turns into cyan. Remember that the NES system is meant to be connected to a television. The video electronics of the day relied on a CRT display, which works by kind of having a high voltage beam scan over some special material, which happens to be a phosphor, which glows when exposed to voltage. The specifics on how these values turn into colors on a CRT are a little bit out of scope, but I will include a link in case you want to learn more. Fortunately, this level of detail is unnecessary for most emulator developers, or if you want to just understand how the NES works. Since each color is represented by only one byte, that leaves only 256 possible colors. Most emulators mine included, simply include a table which specifies how each of these 256 colors turn into a full RGB color. This trick is sometimes referred to as the system palette and can be visualized in this way. Each row going across corresponds with color values 0 up through 0f. The next row starts at hex 1 0, so you can think of the hex values as y x coordinates, and the x and y positions refer to spots in this table. Even though a byte can technically have 256 values, not all the bits are actually used for color. The higher bits are essentially unused. In order to help understand the palette, I've written two small test programs. These both essentially write a different value into each slot in the palettes. This helps understand palette operation and also makes it possible to visualize palette behavior in an emulator. As I mentioned earlier, the nice thing about this background palette zero position is that even without telling the NES to draw any images, setting the first color sets the color that is shown on the screen. This means that this ROM should have a visible effect, even if the only thing you have supported is the palette. I have provided source code and an assembled.nes file on my site, which I will link in the description. There are two versions of this test ROM. First is palette fill no v blank, which is a little simpler but slightly less correct. What this does is it writes the palette as soon as the system starts up. The other, called palette fill, waits for a video interrupt before updating the palette. The second one, palette fill, using the video interrupt, is slightly more correct because technically updating the palette while the PPU is drawing can lead to video corruption on a real system. But because we haven't even talked about video interrupts yet, I've also provided a version that can work without the video interrupt. In practice, on most emulators, setting the palette outside of a video interrupt works just fine. Since the palette relies on a fair bit of indirection, I've put together a little diagram to help summarize what we've discussed. There are two lenses from which to view the palette. First is how the CPU writes to the palette. Palette. The CPU needs to write two times in order to put the VRAM palette address into PPU address. Then it needs to write the palette value into PPU data. The other way to look at the palette is how the PPU actually uses the palette when drawing an image. First, it needs to look up the pixel value from the tile data. We saw this in the previous episode. Then it needs to figure out which palette to be used. We'll talk more about specifics here in the future. Finally, it uses the value found from the tile to determine which of the colors within the palette get used. And we can kind of see a little diagram here. Suppose we're looking up value binary one zero into palette foreground number three. I've left question marks for all the palette values that don't matter, but here, we have the third palette, which is pointed to by selecting the palette. And then within this palette, value binary one zero or two tells us to select the third 
color because counting starts at zero. The color selected in this example would be hex 31, which happens to be a very light blue. And now we know how colors work on the NES. With that out of the way, we can start trying to actually start drawing images on the screen. Next up, we'll take a look at foreground images, sometimes called sprites. This happens to be a little simpler than drawing of the background. Hope you liked the video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. And if you know others that might appreciate this content, sharing helps even more. That's all for now. See you on the next one.